Sukhoi Gar. Greetings, I am Tad Larkin, the lore master of Mandalore, and today I'll be digging through the archives to elaborate on the garbage-littered world of Roxas Prime. Roxas Prime is the first out of two habitable planets in the Roxas system, located within the Teon hegemony of the Teon Cluster, which lies in the Outer Rim territory. The planet supports a breathable Type 1 atmosphere, temperate climate, and 0.2 Gs over standard gravity. A day on Roxas Prime lasts about 22 standard hours, and a year lasts 388 local days. Primary terrain features on Roxas Prime once consisted of beautiful sandy beaches beside crystal clear waters and peaceful inland lagoons but have since been replaced with mountains of scrap metal and lakes of toxic waste. No sentient life has evolved on Roxas Prime. However, over the planet's long history, humans, Rodians, and even Jawas have immigrated there, and at the height of the Galactic Civil War, the population reached around 1.3 million. Due to the toxicity of much of Roxas Prime's atmosphere, most citizens lived in sealed habitats provided by the industrial plants they worked at. As for fauna, we don't really know what kind of wildlife Roxas Prime supported before its pollution, but it's quite evident that garbage worms have made Roxas Prime their home. Roxas Prime's history stretches back long before the establishment of the Galactic Republic, when it was part of the Kingdom of Kron, once a dominant power within the Teon Cluster ruled by Xur the Eighth. Legend has it that Roxas Prime was a favorite vacation destination for Xur, so much so that he left the world in his will to his many concubines. When Xur passed, his son Zim took the throne and expanded his father's kingdom into a thriving empire, encompassing much of the Teon Cluster spilling into Hunt territory, sparking an inevitable war between these two pre-Republic powers. In his off time, Zim the Despot paid frequent visits to Roxas Prime, maintaining his father's lavish palaces and building his own. After Zim's downfall, his empire collapsed and the Teon Cluster carved itself into smaller independent states, eventually being engulfed by the Huts for a brief time. By 14,300 years before the Battle of Yavin, Roxas Prime became the centerpiece of a pocket state known as the Nikatos Buthil, led by a group calling themselves the Machinists of Nikato, and the Machinists transformed Roxas Prime into a galactic hub of science and technology, attracting more corporations to this pristine world. When the Great Sith War broke out in 3996 BBY, Roxas Prime became a target for the Sith Lord Ula Keldroma, who unleashed his Dark Reaper superweapon on the defenseless world. Having a change of heart, Ulic disabled the Dark Reaper himself, leaving the Dark Reaper's power source, the Force Harvester, behind, and it would be thousands of years before the Force Harvester was unearthed again. 38 years later, during the Jedi Civil War, Roxas Prime fell under the control of Darth Revan's Sith Empire. However, no major skirmish was fought there during the war. Fast forward a few thousand years, at the height of the new Sith Wars, around 1100 BBY, Roxas Prime found itself as a key weapons manufacturer, and as a byproduct of this increased productivity combined with the crude technology of this dark age of the Republic, Roxas Prime ended up polluting itself, as it became careless with CO2 emissions and companies dumped waste wherever they wanted. Sometime after the Rusan reformations, the Corporate Alliance and Commerce Guild held joint jurisdiction over Roxas Prime, continuing the practice of dumping their waste and scrap wherever, further damaging Roxas Prime's already almost non-existent ecosystem. Roxas Prime was now the dump of the galaxy. However, this galactic dump was not without its significance, as in 24 BBY, Roxas Prime became the birthplace of the Confederacy of Independent Systems, after former Jedi turned political idealist Count Dooku delivered a rousing speech rallying the people of Roxas Prime to his cause. After the famous Roxas Prime speech, thousands of star systems began rallying to the Separatist cause, seceding from the Republic, and Roxas Prime itself became the capital of this new confederacy. Two years later, full-scale war broke out between the CIS and the Galactic Republic, after the newly formed clone army attacked the droid foundries on Geonosis. 
As war began to spill over into the rest of the galaxy, Dooku made it his personal endeavor to reactivate the ancient Dark Reaper superweapon, and beneath the scrap heaps of Roxas Prime, Sidon Prax managed to uncover the Force Harvester, the power source Dooku needed for the Dark Reaper. Before the Force Harvester could be tested, Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi and his Padawan Anakin Skywalker led an assault on Roxas Prime, and while it seemed that the Republic would emerge victorious in their assault on the CIS capital, Republic forces were defeated, and Anakin Skywalker was taken prisoner. Sidon Prax then attempted to field test the Force Harvester on CIS-occupied Alaris Prime, and before Anakin managed to escape, he witnessed firsthand the awesome power of the Force Harvester, as it obliterated an entire forest community of Wookiees. Now knowing that the Force Harvester did indeed work, Dooku unleashed this power on Mon Calamari, Agamar, and Bakura, before it was finally destroyed along with the rest of the Dark Reaper at the Battle of Thule one month after Geonosis. Roxas Prime remained the CIS capital throughout much of the Clone Wars, but its significance began to wane as the tide turned against the CIS, and after the war, the planet faded back into obscurity. Following the end of the Clone Wars and the Jedi Purge, a Jedi Master by the name of Kazdan Paradis went into hiding within Roxas Prime's scrap heap, and, in his delirium following the death of his beloved Order, began constructing a full-scale replica of the Jedi Temple out of rusted heaps of old Dura steel. Three years before the Battle of Yavin 4, Darth Vader sent his secret apprentice, Galen Merrick, aka Starkiller, on a mission to assassinate Paradis, and after trudging through the scrap yards and fighting off waves of Rodian junkers and force-constructed sentinels, Merrick engaged Paradis in a duel that he ultimately won. With the threat posed by Paratus out of the way, the Empire began utilizing Roxas Prime to its full potential, erecting orbital dry dock facilities capable of producing Imperial Star Destroyers. A year after Marek's duel was caused on Paratus, for reasons I'll explain in a later transmission, Marek found himself again on Roxas Prime, this time tasked with taking out the new orbital dry dock facility, dealing a serious blow to Imperial production. Before he could do this, his holodroid proxy became corrupted after interfacing with a sentient computer known simply as the Core, and tried to kill Marek, fighting him as several preloaded modules, some of Jedi he had defeated before, and one he had never encountered. However, he was able to subdue Proxy. Soon after fighting his way to a nearby ore cannon designed for hurling construction material to later be processed, Marek aimed the cannon at the dry dock, and destroyed the facility with one well-placed shot. His victory was short-lived, however, as a surviving Imperial Star Destroyer descended upon Marek's position in a retaliatory strike, and using the sheer might of the Force, Marek was able to bring down the behemoth, toppling it to the planet's surface to be reclaimed by the scrap from whence it was constructed. Around 25 ABY, during the Yuuzhan Vong War, Roxas Prime was used as a training ground by Mandalore Boba Fett for his Mandalorian protectors, where only the strongest of the Mandalorian inductees were permitted to join the protectors. Han Solo once landed on Roxas Prime after the Millennium Falcon was damaged by a run-in with Boba Fett over the junk world, and Solo soon became the objective of a Mandalorian training exercise designed to cull the weak from the trainees and once captured, he was allowed to go free. This ends my findings on Roxas Prime. If you have any suggestions for future transmissions, don't be afraid to drop a comment. In the meantime, keep your comm channels open for future transmissions, and don't forget to subscribe! Tad Larkin, out.